Hi, my name is Mark Forsyth from the BC Historical Federation, and here to talk about a fascinating new book. It's called Lost Kootenays, A History in Pictures. It's a wonderful look at the East and the West Kootenay regions, and it, it grew out of a very successful Facebook group. It's called Lost Kootenays, of all things. They have about 50,000 followers, and they love to share historic photos and information from this region over in the southeast corner of our province. And Greg Nesteroff and Eric Brighton, they scour the archives and uh, private collections to create this book. And Greg is with me now. Hi, Greg. Congratulations on this new book. Oh, thanks very much, Mark. Why did you and Eric decide to take those images from the Facebook itself, and then create a, a physical book? We were approached by a publisher from Nova Scotia, of all places, actually. Um, it hadn't really occurred to us, although when they suggested it, we thought, oh, well, that's a good idea. Uh, this particular publisher, McIntyre Purcell, has done a number of similar books uh, from other provinces, Alberta, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, with sort of the same concept, um, often based on popular uh, Facebook sites, which is kind of a you know a, a, an interesting or a smart marketing strategy and that there's already a, a built-in audience for, for some of the books that they're, they're creating. I think this is the first book, though, that they have done of BC. It's, it's beautifully done. Uh, the, the resolution on the images and uh, the quality of the images, it really does take you back to this time. And we're going to start our conversation with the West Kootenai, then we'll talk about uh, the East Kootenai in another interview. But could you define West Kootenai for people who don't know precisely where it is? Sure. So we're in the southern interior of BC. Uh, the boundary country is to the west. The East Kootenai is to the east. The American borders on the south and to the north is a sort of uh, nebulous region, the, the Revelstoke area. That we're never really sure whether it's part of the Kootenays or not. The dividing line between West Kootenai and East Kootenai is the Purcell Mountains. But even then, there's a little bit of uh, disagreement. We're not quite sure whether Creston is East Kootenai or West Kootenai. It, it probably ask, you know, uh, or probably 50% of Creston residents would say West, 50% would say East, and there might be some other opinions in there. But that's the, the general uh, uh, portion. We're talking about the extreme Southeast corner of BC. You've selected uh, about eight of your favorite images to show us right now. And, and let's start in uh, Nelson, a, a beautiful city in the Kootenai, right beside Kootenai Lake, Kootenai Lake and River System. And so here we're looking at a a photo of teepees on the waterfront with the SS Nelson behind it circa 1892-93. And we thought this was just um, a, a remarkable photo that you know, showed the, the meeting of First Nations and settler culture. And it was symbolic how in, in very short order, European settlement began to displace the, the Tunaka and Sinaiq's people from their traditional territories. And so this is, this is the photo that really uh, kicks off the book. And it's a tradition that, that comes more from the prairies and, and the plains indigenous peoples, because you, you don't see teepees like this on the coast, for instance. No, and I, and I think these are probably, these probably are Tunaka teepees, although it's, it's hard to, to say for certain. Um, but a very, you know, a, a very unusual and a very striking image. And I'm not sure to what degree, I thought we might find a newspaper story talking about um, these teepees being here, couldn't find any mention of it. And so I wonder if in 1892, this was just such a common sight uh, that they didn't think it was uh, worthy of, of mentioning in the newspaper, but certainly today we look at it and, and are absolutely gobsmacked. Yes, yes, it is part of uh, the transition that, that was occurring at that time. Where to next, Greg? Uh, next, uh, we are going to, uh, to go onto the lake itself. Uh, this is a meeting of two iconic forms of transportation. That is a Greyhound bus perched across the bow of the SS Nasukan at the Grey Creek Wharf. Wow. And, and sideways. So the, <laughs> sideways. And you can imagine the, the trouble they had, you know, backing the, the, that vehicle onto the boat. Although I, apparently there were, no, there, was, there were never any incidents, but the passengers were uh, instructed to disembark while the boat was uh, being loaded onto the boat, which is probably a, a smart thing. Um, the the Nasuk and the ship scene here was one of the two largest Kootenai sternwheelers, and, and the name comes from the Tunaka word for chief. And it had a, a very long and, and storied career that included carrying royalty and, and soldiers bound for the First World War. 
and Japanese Canadians who were headed for internments in Kaslo. And when this uh, photo was taken, the Nasukan had been uh, cut down a bit and converted into a, a ferry. And it plied between Fraser's Landing and Gray Creek until it was retired in, in 1947. But part of this boat, uh, uh, the, um, the pilot house and one of the decks actually survive as a private home on the shore near Nelson. I've driven by that on the way into town on, on the left-hand side, I, yeah. I think is where you see it. What a great place to, to look out and uh, view the, the sunset from. And it reminds us that uh, the stern wheelers, they were the connection for so many people on, on this lake, but also throughout the Kootenays. That's right. Uh, there were stern wheelers on Kootenay Lake, on the Arrow Lakes, on Slow Can Lake, on Duncan Lake. And uh, many of those uh, settlements were very remote communities, often fruit growing communities that relied on the boats, not only to, um, to ship their produce, but for their mail and for their, their supplies. And so they really were, um, they really did uh, unite those communities, connect those communities for a long time. They were in served, the last two were not, the last two stern wheelers weren't retired until the 1950s. We're going to go next to something that became very popular in the region, hot spring development. What is this image of? This is St. Leon Hot Springs or the St. Leon Hotel at that hot springs. It was built in 1901 by a prospector named Mike Grady, who had struck it rich with a mine that he co-located near Silverton. And uh, he, he built this hotel with the proceeds and he had the hot springs water piped to the hotel but he discovered that en route it cooled off and so once it got to the hotel it had to be reheated again mm. uh, and so mike grady ran this hotel for for many years and then he he sold it in the 40s to a fellow named ed gates uh who ran it for a while but he ran into trouble after we were mentioning the stern wheelers a moment ago after the stern wheelers stopped running on the lake in 1954 it was pretty much impossible for the average tourist to to access the hotel and then so it was basically dead in the water, pardon the pun, because there was no way to get there. There was no way to get there. And, and then a further blow came in the 1960s when um, the Hugh Keenly side dam was built near Castlegar, which would have flooded the hotel. And so Ed Gates and BC Hydro were in the midst of negotiating a settlement over the property. Uh, but one night in 1968, the hotel burned down mysteriously. That story isn't quite over yet from the, from no. the sound of it. No. Let's move now to uh, one of the key industries in, in the Kootenays. Of course, mining really helped establish the region, but sawmilling became really important. What is this a picture of? This shows the Carlson sawmill in the cusp circa 1912-13, just one of many sawmills that operated on the Arrow Lakes and in the Kootenays. But we included this particular photo because it shows Indo-Canadian sawmill workers. And as it happens, we actually know the names of a lot of them here too. Um, Indo-Canadians began arriving in the Kootenays in the first decade of the 20th century and worked in sawmills in lots of places, but most prominently in Golden, where the first Gurdwara in North America was actually established. Uh, but they were also in, in Arrowhead and Proctor and, and Wesley, among other places, which is something that is not at all well remembered in the Kootenays. Let's move from the cusp to New Denver, and uh, this takes place, this, this photograph was taken in a Japanese internment camp. That's right. Um, this is a rock garden in, in the orchard neighborhood of, of New Denver. And uh, there were hundreds of shacks that were built there to house over 1,500 people who were forcibly removed by the government from the lower mainland to Kootenay towns like New Denver, as well as Caslo and, and Sandon. And despite such hardships, they created beauty in their, in their new surroundings and, and had gardens like this one, which became uh, popular attractions. Although by the 1950s, they were, um, they, this garden and others were bulldozed to, to make way for new homes and, and roads. But you can visit the uh, Memorial Interment Center, can't you, in, in New Denver now, which uh, I believe they have a beautiful rock garden in, in front of their center. That's, that's right. They, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a lovely site and it tells the story of the interment and it's actually, um, I couldn't guess from this photo, but it would be very close to where this, uh, this photo was actually taken. Let's now head to Main Street, Slocan. So this is a photo that was taken in 1940. Slocan was a 
a booming mining town in the 1890s, but by this point it was uh, swiftly descending into ghost town status. And the building on the right is the Arlington Hotel, which was certainly the grandest uh, building in Slocan's heyday, and it was the site of a rather famous tightrope walk across the street in 1897. Mm -hmm. uh, two years after this photo was taken, the town and the hotel came back to life when Japanese Canadians were interned there. And among those who stayed rather uncomfortably in the Arlington Hotel uh, were David Suzuki and his family. Mm. Um, the hotel was uh, was purchased by the was then later on purchased by the CPR and it was torn down in 1952. That would be their tracks running through the image, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that. Those are the CPR. The reason that the uh, that they tore the hotel down is because those tracks wrapped around the backside of the hotel, and so they couldn't really they didn't have much of a sight line. Unfortunately, that uh, that spelled the end of the hotel. It looked, you know, pretty much the same from the day it was built until the day it was torn down. Of course, it was the uh, balconies were were sagging and uh, it was taking on a very ghostly, uh, a very a ghostly appearance. We actually put that hotel on the cover of the book. We have a couple of more images to show from the West Kootenai, and the next one takes us to an important part of the region's history. That's the Dukabor community. What what is this gathering? This uh, shows a Dukabor youth festival at Udishenya, which is near Castlegar in the 1940s. And the, the building that's, uh, that's seen here is known as the Bjeli Dom, uh, a meeting house that was built in 1911. And the name translates as White House, which was in reference to the building's whitewashed exterior. And at various times, there was a, there was a school here. Uh, the upper story was a communal residence. And uh, this building stood until the Castlegar Airport was built in, in 1949 when it was demolished. But there are still uh, a number of remaining communal homes in the West Kootenai and the Boundary. Uh, most of them are built of brick, um, unlike the wooden one you, that you see here. And there's also a, a set of replica communal homes at the Dukabor Discovery Center in Castlegar. Which is celebrating its 50th anniversary, I believe. That's right. We have a last image from where you live these days in Trail. Take us to it. Yeah, so this is the, the smelter in trailer. At the top, you can see the smelter in trail sometime in the early 1900s. And uh, most interestingly, in this photo, of course, the, the, you see the staircase that most of the employees climbed every day to get to work. Um, it had a bunch of different names. It was called Jacob's Ladder or the Golden Stairway, the Golden Stairs, or, or just the Steps. And there were uh, 328 of them that you, that you had to climb. There's actually there's still a, a staircase roughly in the in the same location today, although it's not uh, not quite as long. And I don't know if anybody actually uses it every day to get to work, but they certainly did back then. They were doing the gross grind before there was a gross grind, weren't they? Very much so. Well, you know, um, not just these stairs, but Trail is also is famous. You know, a city built on a hillside is famous for its uh, its covered staircases, which can be found mostly in West Trail, but throughout the city. And uh, I, I really enjoy uh, going out climbing them. Well, that is a fine sampling of images from uh, the West Kootenai region. We are going to pop over the mountains to the Rocky Mountain Trench for our next chat. And you'll be able to find that on our BC Historical Federation YouTube channel. Greg, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm.